Holiday Gurus Guru Cast. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Holiday Gurus Guru Cast. My name is Martin McKenna and with this particular episode we've passed the halfway point of our series. We hope for this episode to bring you a wide variety and a wide spectrum of different and interesting topics. Once again I'm joined by the ever green and ever enthusiastic Ella Carroll and Shane Clark for today's show. How are you guys getting on? Very well. Really good. I can't um, believe that we're sort of past the halfway point already. It feels like yeah, it's like flying by, and we're having such fun doing it. So it is. It's a lot of fun, but there are also bags slowly forming under all of our <laughs> eyes. But we still have a lot more, uh, a lot more kick left in us before mm. the series is over. Um, yeah. So on today's show, um, I'm incredibly excited to be joined by Lisa Curtis. Uh, she has a really, really amazing story to tell about a certain aspect of travel, which is like volunteering and ethical tourism and just kind of taking a look at a place and making the most of it and just, I don't know, leaving a trail of positivity behind her. And um, we'll be talking to her today about her company, Kuli Kuli, and its work in Africa and also its success in America. Uh, we're talking to Ella, or Ella, sorry, is bringing us around Merida in Mexico and also Shane will be talking to us about the least populated places on earth. So yeah, let's get right into it then with Ella's where to, how to. Where to, how to. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm really starting to notice sort of those that heat is really starting to creep in with the weather. Like I think we're having some mini heat waves right now and I'm just like, oh, I really actually crave a couple of days somewhere really hot palm trees swaying in the breeze and so I was thinking in my head where these beautiful beach destinations are Mexico came to my head immediately um but this time we're not talking about sort of the Caribbean coast with like Cancun and all these sort of uh, huge resorts you know we've all been there done that I'm actually looking at something far more sort of authentic it's a totally different side to Mexico and the best thing about it is it's only three hours away from Cancun so you can fly there have your day at the beach feel lovely and tanned but then really delve into like what really makes Mexico so special all that history and culture music everything it will be like the perfect sort of cherry on top to what will already be a perfect holiday um, the city that I'm looking at today is called Merida and a city of one million people. It's the capital of the Yucatan uh, Peninsula. But despite sort of being, you know, having quite a lot of people live there, it's quite, still has that sort of small town feel. It's all very sort of laid back, very quiet. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And it's definitely super underrated. Um, it's said to be one of the most beautiful cities in the entire Yucatan Pen Peninsula. Um, but even though it sort of has the nickname of White City or La Ciudad Blanca in Spanish. Very nice. Um, <laughs> it's actually super colourful. Like all the houses are painted different colours, like red, purple, pink, like whatever colour you can think of. There's probably a house painted that colour somewhere. Um, and at night time, the city just comes alive. Like, because obviously the weather's so hot all the time. Like it's... I'd say maybe sort of an average of 25, 26 degrees like all year round. Encourages a very laid back approach yeah, exactly. to life. Yeah, exactly. And really, obviously, it's too hot during the day to really do much. You have your siesta. But then in the evening, things cool down a little bit and you get that nice breeze. So the locals are all hanging out in the squares. And this is actually what I think makes Merida so special because um, all the locals are out. They even dance in the squares. Um, every Thursday night, if you go to uh, Plaza Santa Lucia, which is like sort of the city's main square, um, all the locals will be out sort of dancing something called the Jarana, which is like a traditional dance from the region. They all have these like um, really sort of huge headpieces of loads of flowers. The dresses are coloured in uh, like loads of flowers in them as well. And it's called the Serenata Yucateca. The dance, probably not the best pronunciation that time. Um, but it just happens all the time and it's just a totally normal part of life. So you could just be, I don't know, maybe you just had dinner and you turn a corner and there's like loads of people dancing. And if you want to join in, give it a go. Like they're going to really enjoy that as well. 
Um, but it's, that's not just the only one that happens. Like, it happens all across the city. So chances are, if you're walking around at night, you're definitely going to find something going on. I think that um, that outdoor culture is something that it's a little closer to where we are. But in Barcelona, it's something that um, people feel have got lost mm. because of, I don't know, stuff like Airbnb culture. Not to say Airbnb is a bad thing, but no, no. if you are looking for that authentic uh, local experience, maybe that would be a good alternative to the Barcelonas or the more um, common. Exactly. And this is what I find about Mexico is that there are so many sort of um, underrated places, but there's such like within easy reach, like you really don't have to venture deep into the jungle to find like some really pristine colonial town like it's and you know it's safe as well like Merida like does have visitors like a lot of tourists come but it's by no means like a dangerous place or it's by no means super touristy it's just a place where like if you if you want to take a break from Cancun for example and you've had enough of the really big hotel complexes like just give yourself a few days to really soak up what is essentially real life in Mexico you know um and this is also what interests me about Merida is it has like a really rich Mayan heritage uh, 60% of the city's population are actually ethnic Mayans and even sort of the language, like the language, the local dialects still has like influences from that Mayan language. So it's like a real mix of, you know, the, the history of Mexico and sort of the struggles between the Spanish, uh, you know, conquistadors and the local Mayan uh, civilization it's blended almost. And this Maya is like this bastion of Mayan culture, which is super cool. Um, you've got museums that you can check out that, teaches you about the history, about the Mayans and the temples, their civilization, and also sort of just the local history in general, about the way that the city developed, because it still has like loads of this colonial architecture that's pretty much like, it's like an open air museum pretty much when you walk through the streets. Um, speaking of Mayan ruins, you've got loads like within a two hour drive. So places like Chichen Itza, which is like the most famous one of all, dead easy to get to. Um, but also ones like um, Uxma, which is like um, very overlooked, like people don't go there or, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce this very well, uh, Ruta Puk and Mayapan, like chances are if you go to those ruins, there won't be a single visitor when you're there. So you can just climb the pyramids, sit down, have like a, a bottle of water and enjoy the nice afternoon and just sort of enjoy the really unique view of the jungle, which, you know, what better way to feel the magic of those ruins They've than really been well preserved yeah the really well preserved and obviously if no one goes there they're going to last for centuries which is fantastic and also another massive draw to yucatan in general are the cenotes which are these um i don't know how you would describe them they're sort of you can imagine like the bedrock is like just a huge hole in the bedrock filled with water really deep you can go swimming in them the water is super crystal clear and they're like a really magical part of the Yucatan experience. And you've got ones like um, uh, Susama, which are like the most famous ones of all. Again, within dead easy reach. So you can explore the mine ruins, get diving in the cenotes. All the big drawers of Yucatan are right on your doorstep in Merida. And of course, if you want to day by the beach, you're well looked after there as well. Um, just obviously to let you know that you're not in the Caribbean coast anymore, but you're in the Gulf of Mexico. So these ideas of like the really snow white sand, that's more the Caribbean coast. But that's not to say that the beaches in the Gulf of Mexico aren't worth checking out either. Um, places such as uh, Puerto Progreso is a really popular choice for a day trip. It gets quite busy, but who cares? It's like, I think just under an hour to drive there. So you can just pop over in the morning, just chill out by the beach. There'll be loads of restaurants, loads of bars. So if you want like a buzzing atmosphere, enjoy some mojitos, you watch the sunset, then that's the place to go. But if you really, really, really want to get away from it and just pretty much have a day to yourselves, then make the longer drive west to a place called Celestin. And it's this tiny, tiny little fishing village, super sleepy, all these little thatched houses by the sand, and there's pretty much no one there. So if you really just want to forget about the outside world this is the place to be and it's surrounded by this huge nature reserve as well and you can observe like these huge flocks of flamingos that are flying about all the place so if you really want that nature as well then it's pretty much the place to be so there's a lot to keep you busy in Merida so if you're ever planning a trip to Mexico um, and you really want to sort of experience the culture but you know you're worried about like is it safe for me to go to these sort of places off sort of the tourist track don't think twice, just go to Merida and you won't regret it, trust me.
Excellent stuff. Um, I had the experience of working with a Mexican person, um, fantastic woman actually, in a company that was uh, preceding Holiday Guru in my own working career. Uh, you can kind of say that people in general, they do have this um, thing that their own country or their own culture has, I don't know, a special place close to their heart. But the Mexican mm. culture, there is something about it that really kind of stands out as um, just unique probably because of that Mayan influence and how they preserve it and stuff like that. It's sure. just like, it's a real kind of sign of uh, the people are just passionate about where or how they got to where they are now, you mm-hmm. know, so. And it is like, if you, if they can see that you're taking interest and really learning about it, then, you know, they're going to welcome you with open arms. Like they're super friendly, super warm people. So you're going to have an amazing time there. Great stuff. Okay, so thank you so much for this week's instalment of Where To, How To, Ella. I really, really enjoyed that one. And we shall be with you back again next week for another one. Okay, let's get right into the next stage of our show, which is our interview. Okay, so for today's interview, we have quite an inspiring story. Um, So a tried and tested plan for a lot of people once they finish university is to head off on a long trip somewhere exotic. Whether it be a trip around the world or just even a short jaunt around Europe, I think you'll agree that it's pretty common. Our guest today, though, took a pat much less travelled and maybe a little bit more inspiring. Maybe Shane can tell us a little more. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Upon finishing her studies, uh, Lisa Curtis decided to do some good with her time and help some people in need. She joined the Peace Corps and on her travels, she discovered an amazing plant with some pretty remarkable properties. On the back of this, Lisa dedicated her life to building an inspiring company around this amazing superfood, and we are delighted to have her on the show today. Okay, Lisa Curtis, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, how are you? Good, doing well. Nice nice one, nice one. Um, okay, so the first thing I'd love to ask you is, in your past, you've had a broad range of diverse experiences from traveling. Could you just give our listeners an insight into the kind of places that you've been or some of the early experiences that you've had uh, traveling and seeing the world? Yeah, so after college, I joined the Peace Corps in Niger, West Africa. So I was placed in a rural village with no electricity, no running water. That's where I first started working with this plant, Moringa. Um, So it gave me the nutrition I needed and wanted to find a way to support some of the women I was working with and help them sell it here in the U.S., um, since then, Kuli Kuli has started sourcing Moringa from 11 different countries around the world. So as part of that, I've had the opportunity to travel to Nicaragua, to Haiti, to Benin, um, and to Kenya as well. So really all, all over the world um, to, to meet amazing people and amazing entrepreneurs who are, are growing this plant Moringa. Okay, and then um, just to focus on the early stage of what you just said to us there so we will kind of come to the the Baringa aspect later on but just in terms of let's say you did decide to join the Peace Corps what was it about the Peace Corps that appealed to you as opposed to just kind of normal traditional backpacking? Yeah so I really liked the Peace Corps because it, it gave you an opportunity to really live at the same level of the people around you um, you know not exactly but in the sense that I was paid $75 a month so it wasn't like I was living like an American. I was living much closer to what a Nigerian lived like in the sense of not having electricity, not having running water, being in a small village with a really tight knit community. It was just a, a beautiful experience. OK, cool. Um, so when we were doing uh, you mentioned the Moringa plant there. Um, can you give our listeners an insight into how you first got introduced to that plant? Yeah, so I first came across Moringa in Niger when I was uh, volunteering in the health center in my village. And at the time, and still am, I'm a vegetarian and I was starting to feel really weak and just like I didn't have a lot of energy off of the local diet, which was mostly millet and beans and rice. Um, And so they, a couple of the nurses I was working with told me about this plant, Moringa, which is actually a tree. And so they grabbed some leaves off a tree and handed it to me and I started eating it and it it made me feel better. So it made me really excited about the potential of this plant to help improve nutrition and livelihoods in communities like the community I served in in Peace Corps while also providing, you know, Westerners with a a really cool new superfood. Yeah, nice one. Um, And 
as you as you mentioned there you got kind of a, an almost a business idea from that can you explain kind of like the opening stages of what you needed to do to get this kind of idea off the ground yeah it's it's definitely it's been a lot of work um so i got back from peace corps in 2011 and i ended up getting an entirely different job at a, another startup but on uh, nights and weekends, I was spending time trying to figure out how can I get this plant over here to the U.S. And then once I get it here, you know, how can I then sell it in the U.S. market? And um, so I spent a lot of time, you know, talking to a lot of people, driving around store to store, selling it in one by one. Um, and now we've, we've gotten some momentum and we're in about 6,000 stores across the U.S. Nice one. And basically, this whole company from a, from a very, very early stage has been kind of an inspiring and I would say nearly a fairy tale success story of how hard work and application can get you to where you want to be. Um, in relation to the relationship which you have, uh, obviously, you went first with the Peace Corps to Africa. But it's the maintenance of a really, really positive relationship, which is, I think, is why we wanted to kind of get you on the show. You've opened up a lot of doors and opportunities for people within Africa itself in the fact that you've expanded into other countries and also the opportunities that you give to women. I'm just hoping you can maybe give an, in, uh, an insight into that expansion and why you've decided to focus on the women in terms of your own business. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that a, a lot of research has shown is that when you invest in women, they tend to reinvest that money directly in back into their community. So be that, you know, providing school fees for their kids to go to school or paying for medicine for their family or, you know, get paying for better food. Um, it tends to be activities that benefit the, the economic development of the entire community. And, and not saying that men don't do this, but they, they found that often, you know, investing in women is one of the best ways to drive economic growth in the developing world, because often women don't have a lot of the opportunities that are available to men. Um, and so what we found with Moringa is, you know, Moringa naturally tends to be a sort of women's crop. In a lot of places, it's it's cultivated by women, it's harvested by women. Um, and so we've really put a, a you know, strong mission and, and preference for working with women-led cooperatives and women-led um, farming organizations. Um, we also certainly work with men and we're not, you know, we don't, don't mandate that it only has to be women, but we ask that all of our suppliers have women in positions of leadership um, within the organizations. And certainly it resonates for us because we are a women owned business. Okay, and how has your um, how have you felt the reception of um, the local people in the countries in which you've expanded to towards Kuli Kuli? Have they been kind of receptive to uh, what you've been trying to do there? Yeah, I think they've been, you know, very receptive. I think, you know, for us, what we we really see this is as we're not we're not doing aid, um, we're doing kind of like a, a partnership, and so we work with just incredibly inspiring entrepreneurs, um, you know, people who have been able to pull themselves and their families out of poverty and are now providing employment to hundreds of other people in their community. Um, and we really see our, ourselves as, as kind of being the, the link for them that helps to unlock the U.S. market and you know, help them you know, grow their, their businesses and employ more people in their communities and, and plant more Moringa trees. Wow, that's, a, that's really cool. Um, so as, obviously, like, it's a great story and stuff like that, but you know, as with any kind of company, there's going to be some kind of challenges. Can you kind of give us an idea of some of the kind of challenges that you faced in the, the years since you established the company? Yeah, starting a, a company is kind of like a roller coaster ride. Sometimes you're on top of the world and other times you're in this black hole and you don't know how you got there or why you're doing what you're doing. Um, but it is, I think some of the, the biggest challenges we've had is, is the fact that most Americans don't know what Moringa is. And so we've spent a lot of, of time and effort really getting it in front of people and trying to get it out there. Um, and then the, the, you know, kind of challenge of our own success is now that we've gotten some momentum and a lot of more people are interested in it. Um, we started to see some competitors, um, particularly out of India, and we find that often 
Um, many of our competitors are say that they're organic, but they aren't actually organic, and so they're able to sell it at a, a much lower price and really undercut us on the market. Um, so that's been a, a really big challenge um, that we're you know we're we're we want to stay organic, we want to stay fairly traded, and make sure we're paying our farmers a price premium, but we are certainly facing some market competition. So we're trying to, you know, better tell the story of, of why it's important to to have a high quality moringa and why it's important to, you know, eat organic and have a verified source and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, in- interesting. Um, so what can we expect uh, from Cooley Cooley in the future? Uh, is there anything that, guys, that you guys want to do moving forward? Yeah, so in the the near future, um, in July, we're launching our new green smoothie mix, which we're really excited about. Um, You know, after that, like our our long-term vision for the company is that once we've really pioneered how to develop a new supply chain from scratch and work with small farmers, um, and then also pioneered how to introduce an entirely new ingredient from scratch, we'd love to start to introduce other ingredients. We think that there's so many, you know, unique superfoods from all over the world. Anyone who travels will know that, you know, you can find things like Kamu Kamu and Baobab and lychee and there's all sorts of really cool plants that um, we just don't consume very much in the Western world. And so finding ways to help um, help those communities, you know, sustain themselves and and have a, a source of economic development while also providing really cool new plants to the Western world. And I do think that that um, ability and proven record that you have of making sure that everyone benefits from this is something that's uh, a great credit to yourself and your company and uh, long may it continue in the future. Uh, Lisa Curtis, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, You've provided a lot of interesting insights and we look forward to see you developing in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And now, this week's Holiday Guru Top 5. Okay, so for this week, I thought I'd go with something a little more different again. Um, and I go with the top five least populated countries in the world. So, without further ado, number five, Liechtenstein. Okay, so at a population of 37,286, Liechtenstein is a German-speaking, 25-kilometer-long principality between Austria and Switzerland. Beautiful place, but really, really small. Then at number four, we've got San Marino. Uh, 31,595 people there. It's a mountainous microstate surrounded by north-central Italy. Uh, It's among the world's oldest republics and it still retains much of its historic kind of identity and architecture. Uh, Then at number three, we've got Palau. uh, 21,097 people on the island. Uh, It's an, uh, well, not an island, it's an archipelago of over 500 islands and is part of like the Micronesia region in west, the Western Pacific. Um, Koror Island is the home of the former capital, also named Koror, uh, which is kind of a nice little thing to know. Quite convenient. Yeah. So it's like a real kind of like idyllic kind of Pacific Ocean Island. And it's like if you really want to get away from it all, that's the place to go. Yeah, I don't really can get much further out than Micronesia. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, so then at number two, we've got Tuvalu. Uh, again, even smaller than Palau, so 9,893 people, um, an independent island nation within the Brit- British Commonwealth. So Britain really did stretch across the world at one stage. Um, it's like same, same again, similar to Palau, calm ocean waters, palm beaches, stuff like that, like really kind of isolated, but super soaked in sun and really, really nice. And then number one, the classic quiz question, uh, <laughs> Vatican City, only 451 people people living in the city as like as a country if you know what i mean uh, it's a city state surrounded by rome it's the headquarters of the roman catholic church and the pope lives there and it's just like where all the most famous like art and architecture is so think of roman sculptures and like renaissance frescoes and the sistine chapel famous for michelangelo ceiling and um, so yeah so there you have it those are the five least populated countries in the world there you go. I wonder how it works. Like when you live in the Vatican City, like how does it 
work as a country? Like, who do you pay your tax? Like, who do you pay your taxes to? Maybe that's like a really <laughs> stupid question, but I don't know. So a lot of potential scope for us to do some research. <laughs> and they, they definitely use the euro. I'm pretty sure yeah. as well. Yeah, like it's like it's a different country, but I think it's like it maintains like pretty much. That, like it, they speak Italian and Latin, but I'd say they all just speak Italian. Really. Yeah. Like, yeah. and if you can speak Latin in this day and age, it's kind of a show off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shane, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for this week's instalment of the Holiday Guru uh, Top Five. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all we have time for this week. Uh, once again, Sebastian Weber, thank you so much for helping us out on sound. Uh, Shane and Ella, you have been fantastic. Is you always are and oh, um, we're very, nice. <laughs> very lucky to have you here and yeah for everyone else who contributed to today's show we really really appreciate it and we look forward to having you back again next week so have a nice weekend and yeah see you soon see you next time see you next time thank you bye bye, bye. <laughs>